Today, I'm going to answer the completely obvious question that you've been wondering ever since you learned that the Earth orbits the Sun. How much information is in the Earth's orbit? As the Earth orbits the Sun, it does so in an elliptical path. There's nothing special about this. All orbits in space are somewhat elliptical, some more than others. The Moon has a fairly elliptical orbit around the Earth, an eccentricity of around 0.05. Zero eccentricity is circular, an eccentricity of 1 is perfectly elliptical. The elliptical nature of the Moon's orbit is what leads to it appearing at a number of different sizes. The Earth's orbit around the Sun has an eccentricity of about 0.02, which to a physicist who's not too concerned with making precise predictions about the Earth's orbit may as well mean perfectly circular. So, to a good approximation, we can treat the Earth's orbit around the Sun as a uniform circular orbit. This means the motion can be easily analysed with Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the resultant force acting on any object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. F equals ma. Okay, well, ignoring all the other objects in the solar system, which, surprisingly, is an okay thing to do, the only external force acting on the Earth is its gravitational attraction to the Sun. Luckily, Newton also provided us with a handy law for calculating the gravitational force between two masses, m1 and m2. F is equal to Newton's gravitational constant g, times m1 times m2, divided by the distance between the masses squared. We can write down the gravitational force acting on the Earth. F equals g ms me over r squared, where ms is the mass of the Sun. Using Newton's second law, we can equate our two expressions, and we find that the mass of the Earth cancels, leaving us with an expression for the Earth's centropy to acceleration around the Sun. General analysis can be done for a body performing uniform circular motion, with a time period t, to show that the centropy to acceleration is 4 pi squared r over t squared. Rearranging for the radius, we can see that assuming we know the mass of the Sun and Newton's gravitational constant, the radius of the orbit is uniquely determined by its time period. Now, we know how long the Earth takes to orbit the Sun. One year, or 365.25 days. So we can calculate its orbital radius, which turns out to be just over 940 million kilometers. Let's put all of this physics to the side for a second, and talk about some seemingly unrelated maths. Say, for some strange reason, I'm interested in communicating with two chemists. I'm communicating with them by sending them a sequence of symbols that could be either A, B, C, or D. But I'm generally interested in making the life of a chemist as difficult as possible. So each time I send a symbol, I send an entirely random one. Let's say that to the first chemist, I send each symbol with exactly the same probability, 1 in 4, or 0.25. But to the second chemist, I send the symbols with slightly different probabilities. Seeing as no one really likes getting a completely random message, the chemist might want to ask me a series of yes or no questions to determine each symbol that's been transmitted to them. Let's start by considering chemist A, who gets a message where each letter has an equal probability of occurring. Chemist A will consider a series of yes or no questions. Now, they could just ask, is it A? Is it B? Is it C? But that's very inefficient. The most efficient way is to split the letters up into groups, a and B, and C and D. Then ask, is it A or B? If yes, then is it A? If no, then is it C? We can see qualitatively that for each symbol, they would expect to ask two questions. We can calculate this by taking a weighted average, the probability of each symbol multiplied by the number of questions asked. Here, all of the probabilities are equal to one quarter, and each symbol takes two questions to get to. So summing this up, we get two questions per symbol. That was a pretty straightforward case, but what about when the probabilities are not equal? like for the symbols being sent to chemist B. Well, this changes the best way to ask questions. In this case, we ask, is it A, is it B, or is it C? And like before, we want to calculate the expected number of questions that need to be asked in this case. If we take our weighted sum, we have the probability of A times one question, plus the probability of B times two questions, plus the probabilities of C and D times three questions. This comes out to 1.75. Now, obviously you can't ask three quarters of a question, but you can think of these as a ratio. If chemist A asked 2,000 questions, chemist B would only have to ask 1,750 questions. What we've actually calculated here is the amount of uncertainty, or entropy, associated with each message. Chemist A receives a message where all symbols are equally likely, whereas chemist B receives a message where not all symbols are equiprobable. This means that there's less uncertainty, or entropy, associated with the message. In the late 40s, Claude Shannon showed that this entropy quantity, which he labelled H, was a measure of the amount of information that's been transmitted, and he gave it the unit as a bits. The reason for this is about to come clear. More generally, if we have an alphabet consisting of letters A1, A2, A3, etc., 
with a probability distribution x that gives the probability of each symbol being transmitted, p1, p2, p3, etc. Then the entropy, h of x, is equal to minus the sum over all of the probabilities of p times the logarithm base 2 of p. This is in fact what we calculated previously. We took the probability of each event and multiplied it by the number of questions that needed to be asked. But the number of events, n, at each level is equal to 2 to the power of the number of questions asked. But it's also equal to 1 over the probability. So we can rearrange for the number of questions, q, which is equal to log base 2 of 1 over the probability, or minus the log of the probability. I'm just going to get rid of the 2 under the log. Since we're dealing with information theory, we usually just assume that all logs are in base 2. This is where entropy is in the units of bits. The entropy of x is actually a representation of the minimum number of bits per symbol needed to encode a message. In the case of chemist b, we would need to round up to 2 bits, seeing as you can only have integer numbers of bits. But you cannot underestimate how important this idea is in computer science. None of the technology we have today would exist without Claude Shannon's groundbreaking 1949 paper, laying the groundwork for information theory. Although that up until now we've only been dealing with discrete probability distributions, it can be shown that this idea also generalizes to a continuous probability distribution. In a discrete probability distribution, we just have some function that gives us the probability of each discrete value occurring, and all the probability is summed to 1. But in a continuous probability distribution, we have some function called a probability density function. This is a function such that if we integrate it between two values, say a and b, we get the probability that our variable x takes some value between a and b. So the probability is just given by the area under the curve. Because our variable x has to take some value somewhere, if we integrate over the entire space, so from minus infinity to infinity, this should be equal to 1. The simplest continuous distribution is the uniform distribution. This is where our probability density function is just a constant, say p. If we take any two intervals of the same length, x is equally likely to be between each interval. Remember that fact, because we're going to use it in kind of a crazy way later. Going back to information theory, we can show that for a continuous distribution, the entropy is given by minus the integral over all space of the probability density function times the log of the probability density function. The sum goes to an integral. So armed with Shannon's entropy formula, and the knowledge of how to calculate the amount of information in a probability distribution, and an equation for the radius of the Earth's orbit, we're ready to answer the completely obvious and totally understandable question. How much information is in the Earth's orbit? Okay, we started by assuming that the Earth orbits the Sun in a uniform circle. This means that it rotates at a uniform angle of velocity, omega, given by 2 pi over t. Now here's where we get a bit conceptual. Say I was looking down on the Earth's orbit from above, blindfolded, with no knowledge of where the Earth was in its orbit. Because the Earth has a constant angle of velocity, when I take the blindfold off, I'm equally likely to find it in this segment over here, or say, this equally long segment over here. If I take any two equally long segments, I'm equally likely to find the Earth in either of these two segments. Sounding familiar yet? Let's define the variable s to be its position in the orbit. So s goes from 0 to 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle. Now let's do something a bit strange, and consider s as a random variable. Now I just said that the Earth is equally likely to be in two equal length segments of the orbit. So in other words, s is equally likely to take a value between any two equal length segments. And because s is a random variable, s is described by a uniform distribution. So s has some probability distribution which is constant, say, p. We can find this constant by using the fact that the total probability is 1, so if we integrate from 0 to 2 pi r, pulling out p because it's a constant, this is equal to 1, so we get p equals 1 over 2 pi r. Now that we have the probability density function, we can use Shannon's entropy formula for continuous distribution to find the number of bits of information contained in the orbit. Since p is equal to 1 over 2 pi r, which is constant, p times log p is as such, and is also a constant, so we can put it out of the integral. We then integrate and cancel the 2 pi r's, and we just get that h is equal to the log base 2 of 2 pi r. And since we have a formula for r, we can calculate 2 pi r. Plugging in all of the known values, we get 39.8, rounding to 40 bits. If you've made it all the way to the end, good for you, and thanks for watching. Maybe subscribe so you catch the next video.